I understand you wrote this piece, Chasing Light, with the Reno Chamber Orchestra in mind. Yes. Was there something that attracted you to this particular orchestra, the sound of the musicians? Well, I had Scott, uh, Scott Faulkner, the executive director of the orchestra, send me a series of recordings uh, before I started the composition. And it was very helpful to give me a, a sense of the sound uh, of the orchestra in a variety of pieces from uh, Bloch, I think, to Shostakovich and uh, Brahms. So uh, quite a good variety of, of different kinds of music by different composers. Uh, and the first thing that struck me is, first of all, it's a really superb orchestra. It plays really well. And there was a kind of clarity there that uh, attracted me immediately. I'm a composer who's written a lot of orchestra music for large ensembles, symphony orchestras with 98, 110, 12 people. And so the opportunity to to write an orchestral work on a smaller scale in terms of instrumentation really, really appealed to me. I have a number of pieces, actually, for chamber orchestra that I've written over the years, but primarily the focus has been on these larger ensembles. And when you have 40 or 50 strings as opposed to maybe uh, 30 strings in a chamber orchestra, the, the, the whole issue of clarity becomes a, a really a, an important issue in terms of what can be heard in a, in a kind of complex musical texture. So that, um, beside the really wonderful playing, it was that aspect of clarity, I think, that uh, most attracted me to this whole project. And uh, there are going to be 58 orchestras throughout the country. Some of them will be f- large symphony orchestras, and, uh, but most of them will be smaller ensembles. In addition to professional orchestras like the Reno Chamber Orchestra, there's also going to be um, student ensembles, youth orchestras, which is very exciting to me, as well as university ensembles and community orchestras. So there's a huge range of, of a kind of musical expertise that are going to engage this piece over the next several years. What inspired this piece, Chasing Light? Oh, well, that's easy. I live in, I live in Spofford, New Hampshire, which is um, located near Keene, New Hampshire, in the southern uh, southwest part of the state. And uh, there's some really wonderful high hills. I live in one of these hills. And in the morning, it's a much forested area. Uh, the sun streams through the mist in, in the early morning. And it's just a really magical experience if you get up early and experience this. And it was the kind of bedazzling and captivating um, early morning sunrise that really drew me to this idea of somehow engaging the musical expression of that experience, that visual experience, into a, into a composition. In addition to that, I happen to be a composer who very much musical imagination is fired by poetry. And many of my pieces respond to poetic images – so in the case of this particular piece, there's actually a short poem that I wrote that it kind of accompanies uh, the composition as well. So it was the, uh, um, the immediacy of, of these early morning sunrises that are so captivating and, and magical in where I live, and then the, the poetic images uh, kind of intersecting with the musical ideas. And the poetry is something that always seems to get me excited about music. I look for musical analogs to the images evoked by the poetry. So it's a combination of where I live uh, at this point in my life as well as the poetic images and this uh, really kind of magical experience that we often have in in the high hills of southern New Hampshire. Did the poetry come first or the music? No, the poet. well, what came first was the morning sunrises. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then um, the poetry, I, I'm not, I don't, quite remember whether whether it was a musical idea first or a poetic idea. They came kind of together. They, they seemed to join forces very quickly. And uh, once that happened, I knew that I had something that was uh, going to be meaningful to me. You know. And then in addition, I had the sound. At that point in time, I had the sound of the Reno Chamber Orchestra. So that was also the other uh, kind of critical factor uh, in the whole process. And it was the reason that I asked that these recordings be sent so I could have some sense of what this ensemble was like. Um, In my life as a composer, I've always felt I've done my best work when uh, I've either written for a particular conductor or an ensemble that I was familiar with or a soloist who I've had experience with. And I don't think there's any question in my mind that that's when I do my very best work. And so this was a way for me to become, uh, to familiarize myself with the the ensemble, even though I didn't know the, don't know the musicians uh, Mm -hmm. yet. 
uh, but look forward to it today, in fact, uh, for tonight's rehearsal, um, some way of, of um, really inculcating their sound into my ear with the piece that I was about to write. What's it like for you to experience a world premiere like this as the composer? Well, it's happened a lot in my life. So, yeah. I mean, I know the process. I've worked yeah. with professional musicians all my life, and uh, it's a daunting task. I mean, there are, in fact, two new works for this orchestra that of mine, in fact. One work is 25 years old, and the other is brand new, never been performed before. But that 25-year-old piece, which is an important piece of mine, one of my most performed pieces, New Morning for the World, is indeed new for this orchestra. So within the the confines of their rehearsal schedule, they have to engage, um, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 minutes more of, more of music that they haven't encountered. And that's daunting for any group of musicians, even even the biggest name orchestras in the world. Um, some orchestras are better at it than others. Um, my experience with the BBC Symphony, for example, who play a great deal of contemporary music, especially British music, obviously, on a, on a weekly basis, are just amazing when it comes to reading new and difficult and challenging compositions. Um, when I was in St. Louis as, as their composer in residence, by the, t- by the time I finished my tenure in the early and mid-'80s, they had played every one of my orchestral compositions. And I'll never fi- this was the most amazing experience. I was in a rehearsal with Leonard Slacken in the orchestra, and the, the hall was dark, and I was the only person in the audience. And they were working on this new piece of mine, and all of a sudden he stops the orchestra for no apparent reason. And he turns to me and he says, you know what? This orchestra, your music for this orchestra is now like the standard repertoire. And that is to say, they had played so much of my my music and had become so familiar with my voice as a composer that they were treating it like they were playing Brahms or Mahler. And I think for any composer, that's all you'd hope for, that you had that kind of consideration and that kind of familiarity so that the music is engaged at a very deep level, you know. Um, it belies the fact that oftentimes when a new piece is done, the performances are often very tentative because musicians don't want to take a, a chance of kind of blowing it in the performance. And so they you know, really hedge their bed and play a very kind of conservative kind of performance. My general attitude is never give a conservative uh, performance. Go for it no matter what. And if you make a mistake here or there, that's okay. But it ought to be exciting. It ought to be thrilling. It ought to be as engaging as you can make it, you know. Uh, I once remember being at a concert of Jean-Pierre Rampal, the great French flutist. And he was well advanced in age. I can't remember what concerto he was playing. But he was unfortunately making uh, errors along the way. But you know what? That didn't matter. His performance was so compelling in terms of the way he could turn a phrase, the way he could engage with the orchestra, that when he finished, the audience just erupted and exploded in appreciation and applause, you know. And the point is you don't care about, at the end of the day, it's not about those individual notes, those clunkers that he made. It was about how he could make music and communicate with the orchestra and with the audience. Now, in a recording, you couldn't stand that. That wouldn't you couldn't allow that to happen. Yeah. But for a live performance, it was as good as it gets. Joseph Schwantner, thank you for coming in and talking with us, and best of luck with your work. Many thanks.